So, you've built yourself a new server, and you're anxious to get your home lab up and running with virtual machines and mass storage, like all of your cool friends. If this were a choose your fighter screen, my choices would be Proxmox for the main OS, and virtualizing TrueNAS for all of your storage needs. Today, we're going to focus on installing Proxmox 8.0, getting your first couple VMs set up and running, and going over some of the need-to-know features and settings in this latest release. Let's get started. Server room, this is the captain. Rhett, is there something going on down there I need to know about? Ah, we're on UPS backup, sir. The main paradigm couplers have come unaligned. Uh, the tachyon router is uh, tangled with the secondary gazon. In router. English, Mr. Rhett? It's the bandwidth, sir. Getting it down is not the problem, it's getting it back up. Well, do what you can, but remember, I've got a budget here. I'm gonna have to call you back. Hosting your own servers also means you get to host all your own problems. Even the most skilled chief engineers will tell you you should decentralize your network. So why not host your services with Linode? If it runs on Linux, it'll run on Linode. They offer shared CPU plans for as little as $5 per month and can scale as high as you need to go with dedicated CPUs, S3 compatible object storage, GPU hosting, NVMe block storage, and more. Linode is also expanding at light speed, with 12 new global data centers planned before the end of 2023. Visit linode.com slash craft computing and get a $100 60-day credit just for signing up for a new account. That's linode.com slash craft computing, and again thanks to Linode for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing everyone, as always, I'm Jeff. In my last video, I went over the hardware selection for this bookshelf-friendly NAS build. And while I did run into a couple difficulties with fitment, I did manage to get everything installed and running. A quick recap for those that didn't see this video, this is an 8-bay server chassis from Oddhide, which I loaded up with a full set of HGST HE6 SATA Enterprise disks. For the PC side of things, we're running an Erying Micro-ATX motherboard fitted with an Intel i9-11800H mobile CPU which gives us a deadly combination of low power consumption and high-end speed, all while having 8 cores and 16 threads to take advantage of. We've also got 32GB of DDR4-3200 memory, along with a pair of silicon power A60 1TB NVMe drives. I did have a slight issue getting the AS Media 1064 SATA controller to fit properly, as two of the SATA ports stick straight out of the top of the card. Luckily, a couple Silverstone low-profile cables allowed the card to fit and the top panel to properly close. So, now it'll look something about like that. See? It even screws down. Look at that. You can fit so much home lab in this bad boy. Now, there were a number of comments in the build video asking why I went with this particular SATA controller rather than going with a tried-and-true server HBA. The answer comes down to how I wanted to use this card and the slots available on the motherboard. See, we're going to virtualize TrueNAS, which means the VM needs bare metal access to all of the hard drives. The easiest and most effective way to do this is using PCI Express pass-through, giving the VM full access to the AS Media card. The AS Media 1064 only requires a single 1x PCI Express slot, whereas a typical server HBA requires an X4 or even an X8. Since there's only one X16 slot on this motherboard, and I'd like to leave it reserved for 10 gigabit networking later on down the line, I was forced to use a 1x card only. Now remember, with servers and PCs and any kind of build, there are literally an infinite number of hardware combinations you can come up with and all of them likely have a use case. This is the combo that I decided on. And even with 8x spinning drives, I don't expect to be able to saturate the 10 gigabit bandwidth of the PCI Express 3.0 X1 lane on the SATA controller. And even if I could, we're still gonna be limited by the 10 gigabit network connection once I install the network card. For my use case, this is going to do everything that I want and helps keep cost as low as possible on literally every single component, as this SATA controller was only about $55 and a 10 gig network card would be around $30 for this slot. All in all, for a $1,000 virtualization and storage server, I think the results are gonna be pretty fantastic. With the hardware sorted, let's go ahead and do what we came here to do. Install Proxmox. 
Head on over to Proxmox.com, click on the Downloads tab, and find the latest release of Proxmox Virtual Environment, or Proxmox VE as it's known in the download links. As of filming, that would be version 8.0-2. Once you have the ISO file, you'll either want to create a bootable flash drive with tools like Bolana Etcher, or in my case, I'm going to copy it over to my IODD Virtual Disk Manager and Optical Drive emulator that I reviewed last year. There are a million and one ways to create a bootable ISO image, and if you have any suggestions about one that I didn't mention, I'm sure I'm going to hear about it for the first time ever down in the comments below. With your media of choice inserted into the server, it's going to be time to fire up the machine and boot into the Proxmox installer. If you're a Proxmox veteran, the installer really hasn't changed at all since at least version 5, so it's going to be all business as usual for you. But this is a tutorial, so we're going to walk through it all anyway. The first step is to read the entirety of the end user license agreement, which I'm sure all of you will take the time to do. Click the I agree button to continue, assuming you actually agree and aren't just saying that so we can move forward. The second screen is the one that needs your attention, which is where we select the hard drives and RAID setup you're going to install Proxmox onto. By default, the installer will pick a single drive, but as we have two installed in the system, I'm going to want to set up a RAID 1 so we have some redundancy. Next to the Target Hard Disk pull-down menu, click on the Options button. Under File System, you can select which multi-drive setup is right for you. Again, with a two-disk setup, I prefer a RAID 1 mirror. There are two file systems to choose from in this particular setup, whether we use RAID ZFS or ButterFS. My preference is usually to go with ZFS, as it's the system that I know better, and that's what my recommendation is going to be here. So select ZFS RAID 1. This will bring you back to the options screen, where by default the installer thinks you want to use every disk that's currently installed in your server. While I do appreciate its enthusiasm, again we're only going to be using our two 1TB NVMe drives. At the bottom of the window, click the button to deselect all drives. Then I'm going to select my two NVMe drives for drive 0 and drive 1. Once you have everything set up the way you want, click on OK to close the options menu, and then select Next in the main installer. The rest of the setup is going to be region selection, setting up a root password, and configuring your network, all of which is going to be completely up to you. Now note, Proxmox will not work with a DHCP lease and needs to be assigned a static IP address. I'll explain the network setup in a little bit more detail later on, but for now, enter an address that will work on your network, and then click Install so we can get everything set in stone. Once the installation finishes, we're actually done working directly on the server with a keyboard, mouse, and monitor connected. Everything from this point out will happen through a web browser and Proxmox's web interface. Open up Edge, Netscape, or whatever browser you prefer, and enter HTTPS, the IP address of your server that you configured just a second ago, followed by a colon and 8006. Instead of hosting the web interface on port 80 or 443, Proxmox uses port 8006, and the colon and port number allows your browser to make the proper connection. To log in, the username is root, and the password is whatever you set up during the installation. If you forgot the password between four minutes ago and now, you're quite literally boned. Start the installer again and join us back here when you're ready. But I'm not waiting for you. We'll dive into some of the features and settings inside Proxmox that might be of interest to you shortly. But why don't we start with creating your first virtual machine, as that's really what most of you are probably here to watch this video for. The only thing we need that we don't already have to make this happen is an ISO installer for whatever OS you want to run on your VM. To keep things simple, let's create a new VM and install Ubuntu Server. Head on over to Ubuntu.com, click on the Downloads link, and select Ubuntu Server. For this tutorial, the most recent version is 22.04 R3. Once you have the ISO downloaded to your PC, we'll need to upload a copy to Proxmox so it can pass along the ISO to your virtual machine. On the left side of the Proxmox main screen, you'll see a data center icon. This represents all of the Proxmox servers you have managed together, but since we're only running a single Proxmox server and haven't clustered anything together yet, the only thing you'll see under here is your single server. We'll go over multi-server management in a future video. Under your server icon, you'll see three more icons. One for local network, one for local storage, and another for local file systems. Click on the middle icon to access your local storage, which is where we'll store any install ISOs that you want Proxmox to have access to. In the storage window, click on the ISO Images tab and then click on the Upload button. In the Upload window that pops up, click on Select File to browse and locate your version of Ubuntu Server ISO on your PC. Once you have it selected, click on Upload to make a copy onto your Proxmox server. 
If the upload is successful, you'll see a confirmation window appear. Close that and you'll be taken back to the ISO images tab, which is where you should see all of your Linux ISOs in one convenient location. And by this, I actually mean Linux ISOs. At this point, you should be ready to create your first VM. Back on the left side of the screen, you're going to want to right click on your local Proxmox server, not the data center icon, and click Create VM from the context menu. This will bring up the VM wizard screen and walk you through the process of getting the VM configured for use. If you're brand new to the world of virtual machines, they're kind of exactly what they sound like, software-based emulation of physical computers. Every aspect of a PC is recreated either through software emulation, things like PC BIOS, hard drives, network interfaces, to physical sharing of actual hardware, divvying up the resources from your CPU or physical memory to share between the host system, in this case Proxmox, and your virtual or client system. We'll go over this a bit in more detail later in the video. For now, let's get this virtual machine on the road. Proxmox assigns each virtual machine that it manages a unique identifier, with an accepted range between 100 and an identifier that is nine digits long. Unless you plan on creating just shy of one billion virtual machines in a single managed cluster, I'd recommend sticking with a three digit ID. The default is 100, but I hate starting with zero because I don't think in binary, so I'll give my first VM an ID of 101. Under name, this is a human readable identifier, so give it something that makes sense to you. I'm gonna name my virtual machine homelab-ubuntu. Once you're done, go ahead and click on next. In the next tab, we'll define what operating system type the virtual machine will use and what install media will be mounted on the first power on. Under the ISO image pull-down menu, you can select the ISO file that you'd like to use. And as you probably guessed, I'll be installing Ubuntu server with the ISO that we just downloaded a moment ago. On the right side of the screen is the guest OS type. By default, Proxmox assumes you'll be running a Linux-based operating system with a modern v6 kernel. In this case, it's 100% correct, so we're going to leave these settings alone. However, if you were to install a different OS, either another Linux kernel or maybe a Windows-based OS, make sure to make the proper selections here. This selection helps determine which virtual hardware to create for the client system, ensuring compatibility of everything that you're going to need. With all of that done, click on Next to move on to the next step. The System tab is where we start defining our virtual hardware for our virtual machine. Now the defaults for this seem to change depending on which version of Proxmox you currently have or what hardware Proxmox itself thinks it's running on, but I'll break this selection down into two options for you. Since around 2013, almost all modern PC hardware is running UEFI-based firmware, where machines prior to that often used what we now refer to as legacy BIOS. Whatever hardware and firmware you installed Proxmox onto, I'd recommend creating VMs with the same type of firmware unless you have a really good reason for switching it up. Mixing and matching between host and clients can lead to very odd and unexpected outcomes when it comes to memory allocation, CPU instructions, or hardware sharing and pass-through. There are two pull-down menus to pay attention to here which affect these settings, Machine and BIOS. Under Machine, i440FX is your legacy BIOS-based virtual hardware, and Q35 is for UEFI. We're going to be running Proxmox on UEFI hardware, so select Q35 as your machine type. Under BIOS, you'll also see two options, one for CBIOS for legacy systems and OVMF for running UEFI firmware. Again, I'm going to select OVMF. With UEFI-based hardware selected, you'll also need to create an EFI storage device, which is a tiny virtual disk for UEFI firmware to be stored on. Select your local file system storage pool for the disk location. Another quick note while we're on this page, if your operating system requires a tamper protection module or TPM, you can emulate one by checking the add TPM box here. Other than that, you should be ready for the next step. On to storage for your virtual machine, where we're going to create a virtual hard drive image to connect to your VM. It might sound a little odd, but leave the bus device at its default SCSI selection, as a virtual SCSI drive is actually the fastest of all the virtual interfaces. Under storage, you'll select the location on Proxmox to store this virtual disk. And just like the EFI disk, we're gonna select the local file system. Under disk size, I'm going to increase the size from 32 gigabytes to 80 gigabytes. All disks, at least those created on a ZFS file system, are created with thin provisioning, which means even though we're creating an 80 gigabyte disk, it won't actually use space in our storage pool unless the VM writes data to it. Giving it 80 gigabytes allows plenty of room for growth without resizing the virtual disk later on. 
And as you'll see when the install is done, the virtual disk is only going to take up around three gigabytes of space in our storage pool. Moving on to the CPU tab, here the defaults are pitiful as just a single CPU thread is assigned to our virtual machine. The setting you want to change here is cores, with each number being a thread your virtual machine can use. Now this is where a lot of people have misunderstandings about what virtual machines are and how CPU allocation is performed. Assigning a thread to a virtual machine does not exclude that thread from being used elsewhere on the machine, either by Proxmox for overhead use or by another virtual machine itself. You're also not limited on how many threads you can allocate based on the number of cores and threads in your actual hardware. In my case, again, I've got eight cores and 16 threads on my CPU, but that doesn't mean I can only allocate 16 threads across every virtual machine on my entire server. CPU performance allocation is handled dynamically by Proxmox and by your hardware, either through Intel's VTX or AMD's VT virtualization systems that are built into their respective CPU platforms. What you're assigning with the number of threads or cores is the maximum performance you want to provide a single virtual machine, not how many slices of the pie your virtual machine will outright own. Even if you've allocated more threads than your CPU physically has, both Intel and AMD's virtualization systems are designed to automatically balance loads between both the host and client systems. For a basic virtual machine these days, I recommend a minimum of four threads as a starting point. You can always give a virtual machine more if you feel performance constraints are affecting you, but I guarantee you're not gonna wanna allocate just a single thread unless you have a very specific reason for doing so. CPU type is another thing we'll get into shortly, and Proxmox 8.0 introduced a new default type called x86-64-v2-aes. For right now, just leave this at the default, as we can always come back and change it later after I explain some differences in CPU types, and if you decide that your use case is a good fit. Next up is memory configuration, which again is a big area that a lot of people get wrong through misunderstandings or misinformation in the community. Through Intel VTX or AMD VT, physical memory can be used by your host and client system in a shared pool. The maximum amount of memory your VM can use is what you're defining with this option. And my recommendation is to give each VM at least four gigabytes or 4,096 megabytes of memory that it can use. Now, right now, this is the only time in this tutorial we're going to click on the advanced checkbox in the wizard. But a quick glance here shows that ballooning device is checked by default. Ballooning means that only RAM that has data written to it by a VM is considered allocated. Just like storage, unless memory is allocated, anything unused by a VM remains available to both the host and to other virtual machines on the server. Just like storage and CPU settings, it is absolutely possible to over allocate your resources, giving a pool of virtual machines a combined four terabytes of potential storage capacity when your physical storage capacity is only one terabyte, or giving eight different VMs a total of four CPU threads for a total of 24 when your CPU only has 16 available, or giving six individual virtual machines eight gigabytes of memory each for a total of 48 when you only have 32 gigabytes of memory installed in your server. As long as the actual used storage, memory, or CPU cycles doesn't exceed what your hardware can provide, the system should perform as expected. Now, this is a slippery slope, as some services or operating systems will use every available resource they have access to for things like Windows updates or ZFS pool caching. So don't just give every VM you create more hardware than you can actually use. But assigning resources isn't denying resources elsewhere on your system either. It's a balancing act that you'll need to learn for yourself based on what services and resources you will actually be using on your server. Getting back to memory, again, I like assigning four gigabytes to even simple virtual machines, but with ballooning enabled to keep my allocated memory to a minimum. And with that, we have just one config left in the wizard, and that's your network setup. There are only two things to check for here, and one we haven't covered the background of yet. The bridge is a network path between your virtual machine through Proxmox and out to a physical network adapter on your server. I'll explain this in slightly more detail shortly, but by default, Proxmox creates a bridge called VMBR0. And for this tutorial, that's what you'll want to use for the VM connection as well. The model of network card will have different defaults based on your client system OS. For Windows-based VMs, it will often use the virtual Intel E1000 NIC, which will allow for gigabit speeds on a virtual machine. Windows uses this because the drivers are installed by default on basically every modern version of Windows. So out of the box, your networking adapter will function. 
The best performance is actually from a device called Vert.io, which is a para-virtualized network device that negotiates 100 gigabit connections between the virtual machine and the Proxmox Bridge network device. This means connections from one VM to another on the same hardware will have 100 gigabit links between them, as Proxmox's bridge serves as a virtual switch. The downside to the Vert.io network device is it is a Red Hat developed virtual device. And while most Linux or BSD kernels have drivers built in, Windows operating systems do not. But you can add drivers to a Windows image or install drivers once your virtual machine is up and running. But if you're looking for the maximum possible network performance, this is absolutely the route I recommend going. And it's what I'll be selecting for our Ubuntu virtual machine today. And with that, the last screen is simply a confirmation of all the choices you made in the wizard. If everything looks good, you can click on finish and finalize the creation of your first virtual machine. The creation process typically takes less than a minute, and once completed, you should see your virtual machine appear with both the VM ID number and the human readable name that you gave the machine inside of the wizard. Once both those appear, the virtual machine should be ready to start up for the first time. Double click on the virtual machine to bring up a virtual console. This will serve as your monitor, keyboard, and mouse for interacting with the VM. One thing you'll notice is once you click Start Now and power on your VM for the first time, it loads into a typical PC BIOS splash screen. This is because it's actually its own unique PC. It's as if you just spent your time assembling a PC part by part and powered it on for the first time. Only this PC exists only through a combination of hardware sharing and software emulation. Pressing Delete or F2 will bring you into this virtual machine's BIOS screen, where you can actually adjust settings just like on real hardware. Every aspect of this virtual machine works as if it were real hardware. And the reason I'm explaining it like this is because this is sometimes the most difficult part of understanding what virtualization actually is. It's virtualizing every last individual component and part of a PC, putting it all together and turning it on as if it were actually real hardware. If your new virtual machine boots into the Ubuntu server installer, congratulations, you've started your very first virtual machine. I'm not gonna walk through the install of Ubuntu right now, just know it works exactly like it would on a real PC with real hardware. As I said, I wanted to come back and cover networking because that's one area where people often stumble when it comes to learning virtualization. Not only are we virtualizing PC hardware to create virtual machines on this server, but Proxmox's network system acts as a virtual switch for all the virtual network interfaces on each individual virtual machine. During the Proxmox installer itself, you were asked to create a static IP address for the server to be accessed on. What you were actually doing is creating a virtual network bridge. And here's where things start to get weird between physical network adapters, like the one on the back of this server, and virtual network adapters, which exist only in software. Proxmox creates a network bridge and names it VMBR0. This virtual network adapter is what gets assigned the static IP address. A network bridge is actually a bit self-explanatory. It links two or more network adapters together, whether they be virtual or physical. In this case, we have a virtual network bridge with an IP address of 10.0.0.215 linked to a physical network adapter, which in and of itself has no IP address at all. All it's doing is linking our virtual bridge to a physical cable, so the bridge can communicate with the rest of your network. The cool part about a network bridge is you can link it to multiple physical network devices to create redundant pathways out onto your physical network. Inside Proxmox, the virtual network adapters you create for each virtual machine are also connected to the network bridge, which is how they are granted network access through the server's physical adapter. Through these virtual links, you can operate the network bridge like a managed network switch, assigning VLANs to each virtual machine or adapter, creating internal-only networks so VMs can communicate among themselves but not to the outside world, or link different VMs to different physical network connections. The method of using a network bridge as a virtual switch is very common in hypervisors nowadays that you'll come across, with Hyper-V, XCPNG, VMware, and many others using very similar configurations. Before we wrap this up, I also wanted to touch on virtualized CPU types. One of the biggest changes to default settings in Proxmox 8.0 is arguably making x86-64 v2 AES the default CPU type. But what is a virtual CPU type? What does it actually affect in virtual machines? And what settings should you use? When speaking about CPU types, we're actually talking about features available to a CPU things like microcode instructions for AVX or AES encryption. 
For a very long time, the default CPU type in Proxmox has been the KVM64 CPU, which essentially gives your virtual machine access to CPU instructions from a Pentium 4 CPU. That's a 20 year old CPU platform. That means that a virtual machine wouldn't have access to modern instruction sets for applications. Again, things like ABX or AES have specific instructions and algorithms written into CPU hardware, but to take advantage of them, your software needs to know that these CPUs are present and have these instruction sets available. A virtual Pentium 4 era CPU is compatible with basically every host CPU you could ever install Proxmox onto, but it would also be missing those instructions to pass through to a VM. The x86-64 V2 AES virtual CPU type, along having the worst possible name for a virtual CPU interface, also has instructions for all CPUs up to Intel's fourth generation Westmere parts and AMD's Opteron 64. This adds critical instructions for many modern applications, like SSC3 and SSC4.2. And as long as your host CPU is from that generation or newer, we'll give your virtual machine access to these instructions. However, the V2 CPU type still doesn't support ABX instruction sets. If you are running a newer model CPU, I'd encourage you to take a look at some of the more modern CPU types as well, especially if the software that you want to virtualize takes advantage of newer instruction sets. x86-64 V3 adds support for Intel Broadwell and AMD first generation Ryzen and Epic CPUs, adding ABX and ABX2 instruction sets, among others. X86-64 V4 is what I'd recommend for any modern platform. That means Intel's 6th generation Skylake or newer, and support all the way up to AMD Zen 4 and Epic Genoa CPUs. This CPU type adds support for AVX 512 instructions, and ensures that if you are running a modern CPU, your virtual machines can take advantage of all the latest features. If you've had a problem running an application like Cinebench or Adobe Premiere in virtual environments before, it's likely because your virtual CPU didn't have access to instruction sets necessary for the program to run effectively. While these apps will run without instruction sets like AVX, the CPU basically has to brute force its way through each calculation, tanking performance inside of the virtual machine. Now, there are dozens of available CPU types, and most of them are for specific generations or single product lines of retail CPUs. It's fine to select a matching architecture to a physical CPU you have installed, but going with a more generic selection will make it easier to manage or migrate virtual machines between individual Proxmox servers later on, if that's something you're eventually going to set up. Virtual machines, especially those running Windows, don't like to have their CPU type changed at random. So selecting a CPU like x86-64 V3 allows your VM to think it's running on the same physical CPU, even if you move a VM from an Intel Skylake to an AMD Epic Rome-based server. Unless you have a specific need to define the exact CPU model, generic CPU selections tend to keep everything happy for your client OS. Hopefully, in this video, you were able to install Proxmox, set up your first virtual machine, and now have a handle on the basics of virtual networking, CPU allocation, and CPU types, and their relationship between the host hardware and your virtual machines. Just like all server topics, virtualization is a subject that is miles deep, and I've got plans over the next couple months to dive as far down as I can go. Using Proxmox, I'm hoping to cover subjects like PCI Express pass-through, private networking for isolated home lab or developer environments, as well as looking at specific services that you can run in a virtualized environment. If you have anything specifically you'd like to see me cover, please drop me a line down in the comment section below. I'm always looking for new ideas or subjects to cover in videos like this. One thing I've always subscribed to is the idea that knowledge should be free, which is why I publish these tutorials on YouTube at no charge. If you liked this video, learned something, or want to help support making videos like this, there are a number of different ways you can do that. First off, head on over to craftcomputing.store for some quality merch that is designed and made right here in-house. Yes, I personally etch every single one of these pint glasses and coasters myself out in my garage. I get a couple of bucks to help support the channel, and you get some quality glassware. Everyone wins. Second, I do have a Discord server, but it's an exclusive perk of joining the Patreon. It gives you the opportunity to chat with myself, as well as the nearly 800 people who have joined the community. We talk about the newest beers we've tried, share knowledge around all aspects of PCs and home labbing, there are community-led classes on topics like soldering, and it's an all-around awesome place just to hang out. Follow me on the social medias at Craft Computing. Make sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. And as always, I will see you in the next video.
Cheers, everyone. Oh, God, that's dangerous. Not the beer to drink for a tutorial. I'll tell you that much. I don't know if this is the right beer to open for a tutorial, but what the heck. Uh, in honor of the 666th video posted to my channel, today we are opening Adroit Theories, All That I Have Learned, which is a fantastic name, but it's not the name alone that is getting the nod today. It is the 16.66 ABV on the back of it. <laughs> there could not be a more appropriate beer right now. And also one that I'm more terrified of. Adroit Theories, all that I have learned, Russian Imperial Stout aged in maple whiskey barrels. This is Ghost 987 for those in the know, and bottle number 55 of 2000. <laughs> nice. This smells like a very well-aged bottle of Founders Canadian Breakfast Stout, CBS, which I don't think they make anymore. Uh... Boy, that maple and whiskey. It is so, so right there. That is a dangerous beer. Wow. <laughs> the maple is definitely much more present on the nose than it is in the flavor itself. Uh, the flavor profile, very, very rich stout with a very bitter dark chocolate and coffee back end. And that whiskey is poking through a little bit as well with kind of some butterscotch and, and charred, charred wood kind of flavor to it. Uh, not nearly as sweet as you'd be led to expect based on the smell alone. That is super rich. Super complex, ever-evolving, every flavor is there. Did I mention it was 16.6%? Good luck. So this beer has warmed up quite a bit. Um, it's probably very close to approaching room temperature, maybe just a couple of degrees below. It has also mellowed out a lot. Uh, one thing about this when it was cold is it had this super harsh bite right at the front of the flavor profile. And I mean really harsh, like Jack Daniels harsh. Uh, not that it really detracted from the flavor, but it was noticeable and it may be off-putting for some people. Now, oh God, it's just velvety smooth. Which of the 14 flavors I just experienced in six seconds do you want to hear about? Because they were all good. <laughs> uh, it goes without saying, this is an amazing beer. Maybe 12 ounces is too much for a single person. But I also don't care. <laughs>